Hi everyone, welcome to Crushing Doubt. I'm here as always with Julie Conrad. On today's episode, we will have Michael Galinsky, a documentary filmmaker, director, and producer. He uh, created All the Rage, which is a documentary on Dr. Sarno. Many of you have seen it. It's fantastic. Cannot wait to talk to him. Julie and I are going to be talking about certainty, and we're going to be talking about the rules of thumb in using the emotions column. All right, Julie, so here's the thing that I want to talk about uh, for our audience. Of course, we're called crushing doubt, but the other side of doubt is certainty. Mm. And the question that I think a lot of people have is is how to get certainty. Mm -hmm. But I think that one place we need to start is what is certainty? What does that actually mean? There's plenty of people who think that they're certain about something, and then when they really look at something, they realize, oh, I was I just decided to be certain, which is different than actually being certain so yeah go yeah, ahead. yeah i i think you know what i think of when i hear that is trust to mm. me certainty and trust um a trust within oneself and then to take that one step further i think about you know where do you get trust in yourself and in to me that's in self-love self-acceptance all of those things yeah that, that's a great point um when i think about it that way uh, that was kind of organizing for me. That was, thank you. Um, <laughs> when I think about it, yes, you you can be certain that you have a good friend when you really trust them, mm-hmm. as opposed to this is my good friend. And then when you think about it really deeply, you're like, I think I can trust them, but I don't know. That's not certainty. Oh, right. You know what it's like when you've kind of been through something together. Let's say that's actually what happens in relationships when you have a fight. Mm-hmm. When you have a fight and you survive the fight. Mm-hmm. Then there's a level of trust. Right. You, and and I, I think there's trust with others. There's trust with your yourself, but there's also trust with information. And I think that's that's part of what we're talking about when we're talking about crushing doubt, which is mm-hmm. can you trust the information? How and why? I get these questions a lot. Uh, I'm working with someone who he asks the just fantastic questions. And one of the questions that he he asked was, why? And he wasn't asking it as a test, but he said, Mm -hmm. why should I trust you Mm. when there's all these other people that I could trust? And I said to him, listen, it's not that you shouldn't trust them. They probably have lots of good information. Mm -hmm. But one reason that you may want to trust me is my commitment to truth. I'm not, I don't want anything that's convenient. I'm not trying to prove that I'm the best. That's not my motivation. My motivation is to get to the the root of the actual cause of things. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to make sense scientifically and logically. You know, I would take that even a little bit deeper. And, you know, as a a person that would hear that, you know, like that's a great, a great way to pose that to, to someone. But what I've kind of learned for myself is lots of people could even use your same language, right? Like you saying it, I feel a much deeper sense of truth coming Mm. from you in the way that you said that. Now, you could take someone else uh, and have them say verbatim the same words you said, and I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't be certain at all. Yeah. And and I think that that's, you know, again, I say this a lot, but there's this intuitiveness within us, which is the trust that we find when we we really do that self-work and learn all, everything that we're talking about, our, you know, our emotions and learning to trust and feel and and understand ourselves as a human being. But but then it's, you know, you're saying that because it is coming from a place of truth and, and care and sincerity. Hmm. But, you know, maybe the person that comes to sit in front of us is coming for a place that, you know, maybe they've been sold a bag of goods for a lot of their life, you know, and their and their intuitiveness is saying, like, I, I don't know, like maybe that guy's like, you know, I mean, I want to believe what you're saying. And he probably t- in his gut does. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you probably you you probably have that experience, you know, all the time with people that are coming from places that. Um, I mean, they're lucky when they sit down with you to actually feel your energy and presence and, and sincerity there. 
Well, I appreciate the the kind words, and um, I I certainly like to think it's true. But, uh, you know, that guy who I'm talking about, he actually did come to me and say, listen, I have had many people tell me they are certain Mm. that they can Mm. fix it. Mm. And I said, yeah, I know. A lot of times we've heard that. Uh, People have gotten two messages. They've gotten the message, there's not a whole lot we can do, and I don't really care. That's the medi- That's kind of what medicine has shown a lot of people, I think, mm-hmm. in this particular area, even though we're, mm-hmm. we know they're great with some other things. And then they've gotten the message, I am certain I can fix this. I'm the guy. Uh, my way works. And then it doesn't. I'm not saying it, look, it, it may work for some people, but for a lot of these people, it doesn't end up working. Mm-hmm. So they come in with kind of... Uh, emotional scarring from yeah, absolutely from their healing efforts i know i did uh so there's a skepticism i think actually one of the reasons that i do tend to be successful is um i think people can feel that intuitive uh, mm-hmm. connectedness and and genuine wish to help but there's another thing which is that uh, this show talks about crushing doubt, but, but I've said it many times and I will say it many, many times again. Mm-hmm. I let doubt in. Mm-hmm. I tell them, okay, of course you'd be skeptical. Yes. And mm-hmm. I tell them, you know, you're not going to believe me until I prove it to you. So right, because I think, then you're putting it kind of back on them also to say, look, this is where I am, you know, and I can be certain and and guarantee you all kinds of things but at the end of the day you're the one sitting there deciding whether you're going to buy into it or accept it but there's an authenticity and an unspoken message i think that's happening between the two of you that's saying here i am you're kind of saying here i am here's what i can offer here is where yeah i'm going to leave that space for you you know to to make that decision of of what you feel that that you can you know if you want to accept that that this is going to work for you or not but i find this a lot i just had a client as well who she had spent thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars on self um care you know kind of work like going to all kinds of therapies all kinds of therapists um trying to fix her digestion and and get well and take care of herself thousands and thousands of dollars and so when she came to me you know she was skeptical to even spend another penny you know and i said you know hey i same kind of thing like let's let, let's talk about that. You know, where, what are your goals? And let me t- share with you what I can do for you and, you know, work with you on that level and let them decide, but also just being honest and authentic and meeting them and kind of having some compassion um, mm-hmm. for someone that has been down a rough road and, you know, is skeptical because, you know, the last thing I want to do is be added to that list of you know, people that this poor woman has not had um, success with. And, um, and we started at a great place. You know, we're able to really just sit and and um, and listen and hear exactly where she's coming from. Not a lot of people do that. No, I think that's very important. And I think another, another way of putting it or another another angle on that same thing. Mm hmm is that certainty really is something that comes after doubt. In fact, you can't get to certainty without doubt. So there are people who are, they're certain about things in their lives, and then they run into some situation. (laughs) Here's a good example. A good friend of mine from high school, uh, when we were graduating high school, he, I knew that a big change was coming. I I mean, of course, everybody knew the change was coming, but I was like, this is going to change everything and it's going to be hard. I was not, I was not excited about it. And he said to me the night before he was leaving for school, nothing's going to change. He had this certainty about it. And I was thinking, are you crazy? You, things are going to definitely change. Okay. Fast forward to a number of years later, he's giving a speech at my wedding and he, he misremembered this. I'm calling him out on the show, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Andy. But (laughs) He said, remember, we said nothing was going to change. And I was like, no, man, you said nothing was going to change. I was full of doubts. He was full of what he thought was certainty. He meant it. He completely Mm -hmm. meant it, but he hadn't gotten to the doubting phase yet. Mm 
of that. Mm -hmm. I knew that things could change from my history much more than he did. And a lot of things had, had changed in both of our lives since. Now he has certainty about certain things that comes from having doubted things. They're much better. It's a yeah. much more solid certainty. And I think there's also uh, certainty comes with wisdom. And over, you know, the course of our lives and the older that we get, uh, you know, if if you're you're living right in the, in the sense of if you're paying attention and uh, and you're making mistakes and you're learning and and analyzing these things a little bit, I think we learn, we become wise and we be, we kind of look at at things coming our way and say, you know, no, I, this this I I feel confident. I know I know what the other side feels like, you know, and I think there's there's a lot that comes with wisdom. Yeah, so it's funny because when people come to see me, I, I really, this is one of the things that I'm, I think, particularly skilled at is being able to sit with somebody and say, okay, listen, mm -hmm. I understand your doubt. I understand why you would have it. it makes perfect sense. We're not even going to take it away just by me saying I can do it. I'm going to have to show you. Mm -hmm. So there, the other thing that they, I think the reason that, that I can help people have certainty is I have certainty. About well, the do issues you think that I'm you need about. to do you think you need to tell them that, or do you think it's better to let them let them come to that realization on their own? That instead of saying I'm certain that this is going to work for you, and let them kind of well, that, I, that's I don't actually say I'm certain this is going to work for you because because uh, what I what I say is I'm certain this can work for you. Mm -hmm. But there are certain prerequisites we have to get past. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what I think. Mm -hmm. We're working with your mind. Mm -hmm. However, if I can successfully convince you that what I'm saying is true, it will work. It works for everybody. So I think I, I think that I've, I've had to look at this issue and find the right balance so that people can feel comfortable that I'm not a used car salesman, that you know they're going to end <laughs> right. up with a bad product. Right. and have wasted their time when they have already spent a lot of time on things mm -hmm. and money and mm -hmm. emotional capital. It's very hard. It's really so, hard. I, and people just, you know, it's great that they, that they can come and feel that sense of um, well, s safety, really, and, right? To, and to look, be, you have to feel safe with that person. And look, I, I, I think my main point of credibility um, above all else is that I had eight years of back pain myself and solved it this way. I mean, mm -hmm. I hear it time and again that that is such an important part of why people can believe in me because I have lived it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk more about certainty, but I think it's a very interesting concept. And I, I just liked, I wanted to spell out how hand in hand with doubt it actually mm -hmm. goes. So now we're going to turn to Michael Galinsky and his story because he had his doubts, he had his his moments, but he has really come to believe in it. So I think he's got some certainty too. Well, let's hear what he has to say. I'm here with Michael Galinsky. He is a documentary filmmaker, director, and producer. And for many of you who are in the TMS community, you'll know him because he created All the Rage, which to me is kind of the biggest TMS movie there ever was. There, there have been a few others. Um, but yours was was one that I was very excited about when it came out, and I, I played a minor role uh, in in that. And you were you were nice enough to talk to me about it. But it's a real pleasure having you on here, and I, I wanted to say a little bit about why that is. Uh, and then I promise to let you talk. Oh sure. <laughs> so one of the things is I like to give the viewers a pretty broad experience of things, and and you were not only a, a pain sufferer yourself and a mind-body uh, aficionado from, from the experience. But you also have this very interesting take of having made this, this video. There are all kinds of interviews with, with Sarno you did um, and with many other people. So where I usually like to start out with people who have suffered in this way is to hear a little bit about your story, how you, how you were suffering and how you kind of came across mind-body issues. Okay, well... It's interesting. Um, I have a very long history with Dr. Sarno because my father, when I was very young, I think second grade, had a bleeding ulcer and almost died. 
Um, and, I, and I found out later <clears throat> that that had happened before my consciousness. He had, he had, that was the second ulcer. Um, but he was also a psychologist. So mm-hmm. right after he got over the ulcer, <clears throat> he had, um, we had a very small car wreck. I think we had a very, like a little fender bender. I was in the car. It wasn't a big deal. But he got insane whiplash from it, which plagued him for years. And he was, I remember him being in traction a lot when I was a kid. Like he'd come home, drink whiskey with neck up like this and the thing, like stretching his body and just always in pain. And uh, then someone gave him Dr. Sarno's book, probably when I was about um, in the seventh grade. So it was years of this suffering that he went through. And immediately he understood because he had a really good grasp of the mind body connection already as being a psychologist. And when he was able to make the connection to his own life, he had somewhat of a miraculous recovery from that pain. And my dad was cheap, cheap beyond compare. Like <laughs> I think the most trouble I ever got in when I was a kid was ordering a soda in a restaurant. <laughs> like, don't you know it costs 10 cents for them to make in the church? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, the reason I give you that context is he bought a whole box of the books and gave them out to anybody who he ever encountered who had back pain. It was really that meaningful to him and it had that much of an impact on his life. So it was always there, Dr. Sarno, Dr. Sarno. Mm. Then about um, probably 10 years after that, my brother was in graduate school. He couldn't drive or type because his hands hurt so bad and he had, our, you know, um, rep- whatever they called it, um, carpal tunnel RS. And um, he went to see the, the top RS person in the world in New York and they told him he had to have actually <laughs> bone carved away from his collarbone to free the nerves going to his hand. At that point, my, and, and, and he, he got an early like speak and type program. Fi- he got a grant for $5,000 to get that thing we have on our iPhones now that dictates everything we say <laughs> so that he could right. stay in graduate school because he couldn't type. And um, wow. my dad said to him, I will never speak to you again if you don't go see Dr. Sarno. Because he was in New York, he could go see him. He did. Three weeks later, he called me up. And he asked for his car back because he could drive again. He had given me his car because he couldn't drive. And um, it was somewhat miraculous. So at that point, I read the book. And at, at, at that time in my life, once or twice, maybe three times a year, I would, my back would go out. I'd be stuck on my futon on the floor for you know, two or three days, and then I would get better. But as soon as I read the book, I totally understood how it was connected to things that I was repressing at the time. I, I mean, I got it. And I didn't have back pain for 10 years. You know, mm-hmm. um, I had actually one other occurrence, but I was able to get out of it. It was like the day before going on tour, I had to move my heavy amp. I was in a band at the time and I just, I lifted it and my back went out. So I was in hellacious pain for the flight over and the first day of the tour, but I just kept working through it and understanding the stress that was going on. And then the rest of the trip, I was fine. The, the well, point being, cool. I understood it. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I got it. But then later, another 10 years after that, when I had um, a two-year-old, uh, a film that I was struggling with, another film I was trying to make and I was struggling with, and another film I was trying to make and I was struggling with, and I was trying to fix up a house. Just that sounds it, like it quite a recipe. Worse <laughs> and worse, yeah. And eventually, I literally I was screaming on the floor, couldn't move. It took my friend; um, he had to go and get a prescription. We were upstate someplace. It took him hours, but I, I mean, I literally peed myself. I couldn't move. I think it was five Vicodin it took for him to be able to lift me up and put me in a car and get me home. That's when I went to see Dr. Sarno. And yeah. at first, you know, because I was reading the book at the time, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. I was just getting, I just needed that little bit of push. And that's when we started to make the movie. Um, mm-hmm. Because we had just made a movie about the guy who actually lifted me in the car, who was fighting this incredible fight against unbelievable power and failing. <laughs> and um, wow. so we wanted to make that same movie with Dr. Sarno with him as this lead character who was fighting this incredible fight and going up against these forces. So we started to film, but he didn't want to, didn't really want to be filmed. And he had, it was right when the divided mind was coming out. So we're like, okay, we'll film when he does book events. And so I called him up and I said, when's the first book event? He goes, Oh, the book came out three months ago. So he just <laughs> didn't want to be a character. And I, I didn't understand. Yeah. I didn't know how to make a movie. We, we also applied for all these grants to get fun and nothing worked. And so I had shot some in his office. I shot some lectures, but it just went on hiatus until it happened again. And that's when I fell on the floor screaming in pain and I screamed, grab the fucking camera because we're making this movie. And I didn't say it that clearly, yeah. but I, I got my partner to just start shooting as I rolled around in pain. 
And, and th- even in that moment, I, think I, I remember that. the scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to, I knew then right then that was the way we were going to make it. And I was going to have to be willing to be present and be that character. And, and then it took many more years to, to make, but it just, that's the shift that made it possible. And even shifting to that perspective while I was stuck on the floor for 30 days <laughs> kind of gave me even more purpose and, and focus for what that journey was and less ability to kind of, be, you know, push it away. So having that kind of, it was almost like putting that hammer in the wall, the walk, you know, the wall that you're rock climbing because now you're forced to kind of like, you got to just, yep. you know, keep no, doing you're, it. You're, half, you're halfway up the, the wall now. Now your feet are still on the ground, but you got to pull yourself up. <laughs> well, it is one of the things that was so great about the movie is that you are the central character and your suffering is, yeah. is a central character too. And I imagine that did free up Sarno to kind of do what he does best and just be himself in the situation as opposed to yeah, well, it made being space a character. to allow him to be slightly more the heroic character who wasn't having to be as emotionally present as you might you might need for a lead character. So the, it was this whole yeah. conundrum of how do you make a movie about Dr. Sarno that isn't totally about Dr. Sarno, but allows people to have an emotional experience. It's interesting. Um, I'll give a plug for the presence process, which is a 10 week meditation program by a man named Michael Brown. And literally just yesterday, um, a big group of people did it together, this 10 week program, and we'd meet, we would meet each week. But Michael Brown actually joined the discussion yesterday. Um, and I'm thinking about it right now. I'm trying to remember why I was bringing it up. Um, oh, but that it played a really big role in, um, in the final stages of making the movie where it really became about being extra present and being willing to be kind of really there and not playing the role of the person, but also finding right. enough distance so that um, the details weren't so specific that they weren't uh, as much of a mirror, right? So like giving enough detail so that people could relate to it, but not so much that it was completely specific. And so the right. idea was right. with the presence process is to learn to check in with our emotions and, and be with that felt sense of what we feel. And so with the movie, we were trying to create an environment where people would have that experience where before realizing it, they were having strong emotions and then realizing that they weren't going to die. You know, from right. those emotions. Right. Yeah. It's it's beautifully said too, because I think one thing that we 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 capture when we talk about these kinds of things, and certainly on this this uh show we've we've talked about these kinds of things, that people really are they they feel it at that level. That they will oh. die if right. they have these emotions. I mean, it's a very important thing to say because most people just don't don't realize it. When I when I explain what I go through internally about certain events, it can sound very extreme because it is, you know, we're really grappling right. with huge things. So yeah. go ahead. Well, I was going to say what you hit on is something that, um, you know, a lot of times when we think about trauma, we think, you know, really big T trauma, capital, capital T trauma, right. But we think of it as bigger than what we've experienced. But when you're four and you need to be picked up, by your mother and your mother doesn't realize the intensity of that and says, no, you need to learn to take care of yourself. That's traumatic. And it's no less traumatic than say, um, you know, bullets whizzing by your head when you're 23, because Mm -hmm. it's where you're at and what you have to, you know, what capacity you have to deal with those things is all relative. And I think, it's connected. So if you needed something when you were four and you did not get it and you are, did not process that, that still has a, ma- a major impact on you. Mm-hmm. And so you'll see that like with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder from say military combat, not everybody does. Some people do. And when we ask the question why and we dig into it, we start to recognize that it's probably related to earlier traumas that are exacerbated by later traumas. And so all right. of these things are deeply connected. And the, the point of saying that is that all of our traumas are relevant. And when we dismiss them, we're actually trying to protect ourselves from having to deal with them. But if we actually just sit with those traumas that seem so overwhelming and they might kill us, if we can kind of go through them, 
then we have more capacity to deal with the other traumas that arise in our lives. I, I totally agree. And I think that's such a wise way of thinking about it. One of the things that I often suggest to people in terms of like an action step of how they can start thinking about things differently is to stop thinking about first world problems. I'm going to put in quotes because right. there's st first world problems are still problems. <laughs> if if you um, live in the first world, your first world problem is your problem. But you're making, I think, an even more key point, which is they're not really first world problems. They're traumas. They're, and, they're emotional issues. Yeah. You know, when you and I, when you and I met and you were, you know, getting, getting the movie set to roll out and I was right. talking to you about it, we had a conversation once. I don't know if you'll remember it so well, but it was in December, actually. Um, mm -hmm. We're in, De in December now as we're filming this. Um. And it was about all kinds of things. But one of the things I told you about is that I was in uh, an analysis, psychoanalysis. And the guy I was seeing didn't believe in TMS. Yeah. And he didn't believe in TMS even after I got better within six weeks of reading right. The Divided Mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how, what? so what are you thinking happened? And he was like, I just think your back got better. I was like, you think that I randomly got better? at this time. Mm -hmm. So I I was explaining this to you and you said something that really changed things for me. And I, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for it. You said, how can you work with somebody who doesn't believe in everything you believe? Right. And I was like, wow. Now that set off, it wasn't just that, but right. that, that conversation did get me thinking. And, and a, a couple months later, I kept challenging. I kept advocating for myself and trying to say, can't you see how this is totally damaging to our relationship that you won't take this in? You won't think mm -hmm. about it. You won't read the book. You won't do anything. And eventually I, um, I had to, I had to get rid of this therapist because right. it was not working out. Now, one of the interesting things that happened in the aftermath of that is I did not realize he was treating me for the kinds of things he thought that I needed treatment for. But right. what I really needed treatment for was trauma. Right. And I didn't know it. I just like you, like, like you're saying, I had these ideas that, well, what I had wasn't trauma. Right. Oh, but yes, it was, <laughs> I, right. uh, you know, and now when I look back at it, there was even some capital T trauma in there that I was mm -hmm. denying. Right. And or I wouldn't say denying, but it was like, I, I had this, commitment to be fine. Right. And you're saying, which I totally applaud and, and admire and, and value bringing it into here is you've got to let in the idea of your own trauma. Right. So you obviously would have had to do that some in your own recovery process. I don't know yeah, how old your kids are now, by the way, but uh, you, 18. how old were they when you were, and how old were they when you were doing the filming? I'm not remembering. It was about six, seven years ago. So like 12 and, you know, um, eight. Yep. But, but you, know, uh, you know, it, it was, an, it was a, a, you know, 10 year process of making the movie. So one wasn't even born when we started making the movie, really. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we, we know that those early childhood years, especially, they bring up so much stuff in us right. because they bring it back what it was like to be a kid. And there's nothing, you know, whatever trauma you might have as an adult, the trauma you had as a kid was even worse because you can handle less. It's just like what you said. Right. And I think until you've really done the work to move through the things that you struggle with from your own upbringing, no matter what, you're going to repeat those patterns as much as you try. It may look different but it's, you're still going to do many of the same things because you're going to enact the dramas of, of your childhood. And, you know, one of the central um, pieces of our film is this speech that my father wrote for my wife and I for our wedding. And it's really about, um, it's about being, you know, a character actor rather than a star because the character actor mm -hmm. has to adjust to the role and play the part. The star gets stuck in the role. And so if you can be the character actor, you have more um, grace and ability to kind of uh, drop into moving and changing and growing. Whereas the star kind of changes and grows, but generally it's so proscribed, we see it happening. We understand it in this kind of um, 
writ large way, but it's the character actor who's not taking anything so seriously that right. finds a way and, and, and not taking everything so seriously is really more about finding acceptance with what is. You just kind of roll with what happens rather than react to it. So if you're rolling with it, you're responding rather than reacting. If you fight against it, you're reacting. And this goes to the heart of the presence process, which is really about learning to recognize when we're reacting. If we're angry, we're reacting, right? We're yeah. not accepting what is. And so once, so in week three of this 10 week program, Every time you get angry, you check in with yourself and you realize that your anger is about you. That person didn't make you angry. That person did something that you reacted to. And so that anger mm -hmm. has to do with expectation that things shouldn't be how they are. Or, you know, it's interesting because it goes back to your conversation about um, the therapist. Even while making, before dropping into the second phase of making all the rage, I had gone to a doctor because I, that second phase of my terrible back pain was starting. And I told him about Dr. Sarno and he's like, yeah, that guy's a quack. It's bullshit. And I, I, I should have just recognized, okay, this isn't right. But it made me angry. He also was just really dismissive in so many other ways. Mm -hmm. And yet I didn't walk out of there and I didn't have to walk out in anger. I could go, oh, this is so not right for me. And, right. and, and that's a process where part of the process of getting out of drama is realizing nobody else is responsible for our anger, even our parents. Because the truth is, they were doing the best that they could. And it may not have been nearly good enough for us at the time, but it's because their parent didn't do well enough for them. So how do we, who do we blame and, and what use is blame? So there's this middle ground where, where do you find that balance? Um, if you present the person with what you notice as a problem and they dismiss you, well then, you know, you're just gonna to have to set up boundaries within that relationship. So when it's a close family, you just, you can have some boundaries, not have to react to everything they do, still try to keep a relationship with them as long as you're able to handle that. If you can't handle that, fine, step away until you grow enough till you don't react. Until you find ways of recognizing the reaction is actually a beautiful message to you that there's some work you need to do. And so like one mm -hmm. of the questions I always get after the movie is, are you better now? And, and my answer right. is, well, you know, I still have this really profound disease of being human. And as long as we're human, <laughs> we're, we're still going to be stuck in this world. And this world is an artificial intelligence. It's, it's a construction. But the more that we're able to accept that, respond to it, recognize we're having a reaction and move on, we don't get it stuck in our body and we move on. Um, and yet here we are in a pandemic. So everybody's having a lot of this stuff all the time because <laughs> right. there's things that we can't control. Absolutely. And, you know, I get questions like that too. Are you, do you ever have symptoms? And I, I, I say, actually, I pay very close attention to these things because I'm studying it and I'm trying yeah. to learn about it and try to help people with it. So I have some kind of symptom every day. Right. It's a, it can be a very tiny one. It could be, oh, my elbow yeah. just hurt there and stuff. And it, it really is about being human. But I wanted to highlight something you said. Um, you know, I think people do often look for well, who, who to blame about it, but I love that there's a way of stepping out of that. Whether whoever would be to blame or not, the other, the other way of looking at it is that there's something you can do. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. That you have choices with yourself and you can decide, you know what, I'm not going to go down that route this time. And that, that's kind of what happened with, with that therapist. I had been fighting with him to get him to see it. Right. And I realized I had the option to not fight with him. Right. It's also not, not your responsibility to fix him. Part of it was like, can't no. you see? I, I, I found right. the solution I was trying to help fix you him. too. Yeah. It's not yeah. your and I was, I, And I was trying to fix him so that he could fix me. But, but so this is one thing I wanted to talk about is, is the things that changed for maybe, maybe you and, and certainly for me, but mm -hmm. I, I imagine for you too. When we discover this way of thinking, to me, it was life-changing not mm -hmm. just in terms of reducing my pain, mm -hmm. but in terms of things like that, in terms of understanding that I had had trauma. Right. And that I need to, I need to be kinder to myself or to realize that I actually was judging myself for certain things right. or blaming myself for things that were, you know, 
totally insane. You know, I, I would look around and be like, where are the, all these father figures that I felt I really needed? Because my backstory is that my, my father died when I was very young and I was mm. always looking for father figures. Mm-hmm. I have a, a father now who stepped in and remarried, uh, married my mom, my mom remarried him mm-hmm. uh, when I was three, but it was a process of connecting with him. Right. And so I was always looking for, for father figures. And this, this thing that happened with the therapist actually finally ended that for me. I, right. I, I realized I had a choice to not look for that anymore. Right. I don't need to subject myself to that. But I was actually blaming myself the whole time. Like I am not lovable enough. And that's why no father figures are, are um, attaching to me. Right. And to set yourself free from that. So I wondered if you could speak to a little bit the kinds of growth that you went through as you discovered these things. Oh, well, definitely still going through. I just, yeah. I just, this morning, I was realizing that um, January 25th will be the 15th anniversary of my father's death, which also plays a role in the movie. And um, Mm -hmm. my mother died a year ago. So um, Mm -hmm. sorry to hear that. It's just been a really interesting time. Yeah. So she, she died just, you know, six months before the pandemic started. And before she died, there was a four month period where she had fallen and cracked her skull, but she fell because she was having a lot of anxiety and having small seizures. And two days before she fell, I met with her doctor and her social worker to say, can we try to address this anxiety? And she said, you see it your way. I see it mine. There's not a problem. And it was not a very comfortable discussion. Um, So it was a little frustrating that two days later it happened. And then it was, that led to a huge stroke and just four months of decline. But what was interesting about that wow. process was it was a, it was a very healing process because I had at first, you know, she had this fall and the stroke, which, you know, the, it was a brain bleed. And so I was trying to fix it, trying to fix it, trying to get her better. And finally I just had to be like, she's going to get better on her own or not. And I had to just move into acceptance and moving into acceptance of that also calmed her down a lot. And I'd had a previous experience with her where she was so anxious that I always had to be kind of resistant in that space with her because I would be overwhelmed by that or would overwhelm the situation. But on a trip with her, I learned to just accept it. And as soon as I accepted it, it went away. Like the, le- the, the <laughs> need to control things, you know, I was like, I really was in the space of actual acceptance rather than just saying, yes, I, whatever you want, but just emotionally. And, there, and then the whole trip was great. And I just learned this really powerful message about when we resist those things that we don't even realize we're resisting because we're doing it emotionally and we're, we think we're, yeah. you know, we're smiling and saying everything's fine. But if our emotional energy is closed off, then the person's just going to act defensively. And th- the point of that is, is that same thing goes to even our past relationships. If we're holding ourselves in um, intention around our feelings about say our father or our mother, and, you know, my, my father was pretty judgmental and controlling in his own way. Um, and that was a real problem for me. And we had a lot of conflict. And then we tried to work through it. And we, and we did a little bit. And, and I, I definitely felt that when he passed, we were in a good place. And I was very thankful for that. There's still, our lives are going to be constant levels of processing of what, what that means, especially as, you know, being a parent and, and learning to recognize that we're repeating those patterns. And it, it's very difficult you know, and we just have to stay mindful and present as much as we can. I like how you you're highlighting though, the idea of real acceptance versus a kind of perceived acceptance or a a willed, willed acceptance, because it's not not acceptance. Exactly. It's pretend. And we feel like, okay, well, I'm doing what you ask. Yeah, exactly. I I accepted it. And it's, it's a, it's amazing how we have to we have to look at that. So actually, that made me think of um, one one last question that I wanted to ask sure. you about, because in all the rage, Sarno does end up being a particular character, and there's a particular narrative that he has. Mm-hmm. And you watch you watch the years of frustration that he dealt with, mounting, and his kind of sense of pessimism uh, towards towards the end of his career. Um, mm-hmm. at least that's how I read it. And as I, I saw it, I think it's pretty clearly laid out there in all the rage. And, yeah. and, and so I wondered what, what that was like for you ob- obser- observing that and, and even thinking back on it, you know, was he, was he either struggling to accept something that was, 
or was he feeling that he had to accept something that actually wasn't, <laughs> you know, maybe his, his pessimism after being kind of beaten down over the years isn't uh, actually accurate. I don't think it is. I, I think that what he did is, is so great and, and that the future of this right. field is growing. Yeah. I think he, like you or I, was a very complex and profound human being. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because, you know, I, I'm the optimist in the movie and I'm the optimist in so many areas of my life where I'll push in and say, no, no, you can make this happen. We'll, we'll make this happen even with him early in the filming. But it, in some ways that pessimism made it difficult for me to make the movie because he wasn't as invested in doing it. And yet yeah. I think he, he knew enough that he couldn't, you can't push it into the world. And, and so it's interesting to see how much our, our kind of experience mirrored his. We made the movie and interestingly enough, it doesn't really fit in the film world because it doesn't, Hue to the paradigms that are expected in 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 that space, and you know, interestingly enough, even from the point of view of the film critics, didn't see it as being. Um, it, it's neither nor. It's not you know like a character study. So it's not enough about Sarno, and it's too much about me without being about me. And I don't really rate being. So it's this kind of like the film in it, at its core is about how our culture shames us for having emotions and how that um, that causes us to have health problems. And that's the central message of the film. But both the LA Times and the New York Times chose to shame me directly for being in the film. So the, the LA Times review is, director hijacks his own film is the title. And the first oh line of the God. New York Times review is, um, director distance thyself. That's what you'll be saying. But if you look at it from the perspective of, okay, they're critics, which means they're critical. And we become critics when we want to judge and, and, and take you know, energy away from paying attention to ourselves, then it, it all makes sense, which allowed it, me to not take that personally and actually see it as an awareness. Okay, well, of course that's gonna be the response. You know, obviously I didn't love that largely because it also limited our ability to get it to people. And so right. we face the same situation where there's so much resistance to this idea and the way of making the movie that it's very, very slow process. And yet very much like Dr. Sarno's film, it slowly moves into the world because of word of mouth. But even that word of mouth is hampered by people's sense of shame over even having these issues to begin with. So people are less likely to say, hey, you need to see this because then it says, hey, you need to see this because I had a problem and it helped me. And I, and right. I see right. that so much in the way that people talk about it or, or share it, you know? And so for me, part of that is I'm actually learning to kind of learn from Dr. Sarno. So for the first say year of doing it, I would, I was pushing and trying to get people to do it, trying to get people to work with us until I realized, oh, you know, um, the teacher appears when the student is ready and not before. So it's very much like you and the therapist. I, I can't make anybody get it, but I can present yep. it. And, and, and it's also the energy with which I present it has an impact. So if I type it to some uh, message, somebody, hey, you should see this movie and they get that message, they get it energetically. I literally will, if I'm feeling, oh, I felt like that, like I felt like I was pushing it, I'll erase it and retype it and it will have a different effect. I swear to God that your no, energy that you point. bring to whatever, it affects it. It affects what goes through the airwaves. I totally agree. The more I needed someone to see this, the less they would. You know, and, and when I, when I yeah. take the heat off of it and just say, okay, well, I'm going to present what, what I think about this, then it's yeah. much more, much more hearable. Not only that, it's they're ready or they're not. And if they're ready, they'll right. go, oh, that sounds like it's, re uh, it's right for me. And if they're not ready, they'll dismiss. It. And then we're all better off anyway, because it just creates negative heat if they're not ready for it. I, I totally yeah. agree. And listen, Michael, I want to thank you for coming on. I, I could talk to you for a long time about this. I hope you will come back. I, it would be yeah, great we'll, to we'll have you back. We'll do it again back. in four months. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. And, you know, I I really value the the wisdom that you bring about this, the the humanity you bring about this. And, you know, you, you're a great storyteller. And, uh, you know, I want to hear more about the projects you have going on. We'll, we'll, We'll plug those. Uh, you you let you let me know what they are, and I'll get them out in the newsletter, or maybe we'll talk about them next time. But yeah, thank great. you so next much time for I coming come on. on. 
All right. Next time oh, I come on, I'll come on. I'll just tell you, I'll come on with my 26 year old daughter that I just met. <laughs> Is that really what happened? What? Yeah. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> wow. Talk about a teaser. Okay. That's amazing, Michael. So uh, now, now you'll definitely want to be tuning in when, when he's back. Cause we, we have, there's a story behind that. Amazing. Thank you for joining us, Michael. I, it's, I so appreciate it. Can't wait to have you on again. Thank you. I've got to say that was a great interview. The, the film is amazing. And I hope everybody out there goes out and sees it or at least um, lets us know what they thought. I, you know, if they saw it themselves already. I'd be curious to know. Um, but uh, yeah, what- when Michael, when Michael and I talked about the, the film, when it was in process and, and I, I played a very minor role as just a supporter, basically, but he and I talked and we really had high hopes that this film would get seen by more people. And so it yeah. still needs to be seen by yeah. tons of people. It's a great, it's a great film. Yeah. It's, you know, and I, th- there can't be enough of this, I feel, um, you know, out there just so people can realize how, how much suffering is going on and how, mo- how much help there is um, and how much we can do on our own, you know, um, with just understanding you know, the mind and the body, just even a little bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, one, one thing that I've heard over and over, including about our our podcast here is that it makes people feel less alone to know that there are people out there who are grappling with these things, thinking about these things, saying ideas. So, uh, I did want to remind everyone who's watching to click subscribe, click like, ring the bell for notifications. And spread the word. You know, we're trying to get this to as many people as possible. And Reach one of the out reasons, to us. Tell, us yes. tell us what you think. We're, we, we love reading your comments. Yes. Put, put comments below. And that includes comments of things you want more of. So one thing that we've started to develop is that this, this part of the, the, the show, the, the segment, is about how. That's the question I get over and over. Okay, I love it. I love it. How do I do it? Yep. So we get into the nuts and bolts of things here. Now, I want to remind everybody, hopefully you've seen the or heard the previous episodes and so you're up to speed. If not, you may want to go back to them, but this this will actually be useful to you anyway. What we're going to talk about is when so I have these these different columns and I've come to see that I thought I had four columns, but what I really have is three columns and they each have action steps. The action steps column is a column, I suppose, but what we're going to be dealing with is the action steps of the emotions column. So I wanted to remind everybody this uh, it, when we're looking at the emotions column, what we are looking at is the onset of new symptoms or the uptick of old symptoms. A lot of times people say to me, well, I can't find the emotion attached because it's always the same physical thing over and over and over. That's a doubt it, issue right there. And you probably also have people um, that say it's different all the time. Also true. Or, <laughs> or or they'll say there's too many emotional things to sort right. it out. Where do I start? <laughs> now, listen, these are all legitimate questions and problems to have about this. But one advantage of what I, uh, you know, talk about and kind of teach is that there are rules of thumb. There are ways of thinking about this. There's, there's a map to kind of figure this out. That's what I was oh. going to say. The fact that there is literally a map of of exactly where to start, what you can work through. I mean, what do you usually, do you see any stumbling along this? Uh, You know, obviously there's going to be some stumbling along all the different uh, tiers here. Um, But in this area, do you see much of um, compared to the other, the other steps, any difference in, in, and what do you mean the happens? other? Do you mean the other columns? Yeah, the other columns. Like, are there? Do you feel like that this one is really yeah. where it starts to get to get uh, the healing really begins, um, or is it just kind of a process all the way through? Listen, that's a fantastic question. But here's what I would say: that, um, it's different for everybody. You you can find people who all three of the main columns are very active. You can find ones where power is the linchpin and, you know, and they've been being told. Meanwhile, emotions, that's the one thing that everybody talks about. Sarno talks about it. Many other people talk about it. So this is the one 
The differences I bring when, when it comes to the emotions column are the very specific roadmap of what to do and how to recognize it and how to okay. use it. So one of the things that came up recently, um, I was talking with somebody and they were saying, okay, I, you know, I keep trying to find the emotions and things, but, but I can't do it because this is pain that's consistent. It's like at a level four, you know, in pain work, we know people are often giving it a number to give some kind of subjective sense. <laughs> So they'll say, uh, so I'm working with one woman who she wakes up with a level six headache, headache. Then she tends to get it down to about a four and then it just stays there. Well, listen, if you're staying at the same level, it's not an emotional issue. That's, that's not where it came from. Maybe the initial onset way back when was emotional. Is Once that like their in, new normal? Have they, have they, they made their, their, uh, uh, they believe their, it to be yes. Their stand, their status quo, I guess they have. Yeah, but see, this is why the doubt column is so important. When you have, when you have a status quo or you have a plateau, the way you break through it is not by finding the right emotion of the moment. They'll say to me, "Well, how do, how would it make sense to look for a, an emotion when really I have this all the time?" And I say to them, "You're exactly right. That's how I came to understand that there's a doubt column because I had the same thing. I would." So one of the key things you do, one of the action steps that you do, and I wanted to remind everybody, these are action steps of thinking. They're a potentially helpful way of thinking that changes your thought process and, and then changes your physiology through that. So you can try on some of these. One of the rules of thumb that I have that helps if it is an emotional issue is to pair a very specific emotion with a very specific onset or uptick in a symptom but I want to underline that onset or uptick. Can you explain uptick? Like what's, what would be an uptick? Okay. Well, the woman who has a plat plateaued at four and a headache, let's say she suddenly gets an eight. Okay. That's an uptick. That's the same symptom, but the intensity has gone up. Okay. So if there's ups and downs in the symptom, there, there's usually something emotional going on. Um, however, if the ups and downs are pretty much always the same, that's a doubt issue. So this what is if where there's I need to a help predictability. People. If there's a predictability to it, does that also play? Uh, yeah, that tends to be a doubt issue also because then oh, okay. they've come to they've come to believe their schedule. Like the woman who wakes up with headaches of six, uh -huh. she, that's a predictability issue. She mm -hmm. wakes up and and I I analyzed it with her and we came to that she takes certain pain medications at night. And she wakes up thinking the medication's out of me now, so I'm now going to have a headache. Oh wow. Okay, so. There could be an emotional experience within that, but I call that doubt. That That's about a thought process mm -hmm. that's setting up a way of moving. So let's deal with what is emotional. And that is if you weren't having a symptom before, but suddenly you are. Listen, I will say that can happen from a trigger. We know we talked about my hernia surgery recently, and that was a trigger, and I knew it was going to trigger things. But it also was emotional. So sometimes it's a little hard to tease out. But the first place you want to look when there's a new symptom is what happened. Not physically. What happened emotionally. And so there's the rule of thumb that, it, you know, it's new symptoms and, and upticks. But here's another basic tenet of, of this. The timing of the symptom always matters. I've talked about this before. If it's an emotional issue, the timing is exact. That is why when people say to me, but I've had this symptom for four years and it's always the same. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That means it's not an emotional issue, which is really interesting because that's not actually what Sarno would say. Hmm. He would say, no, it's still an emotional, I, I think. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna speak for him, but I have read a lot of his stuff. Um, he would say, and a lot of people who deal with mind-body things would say, no, you just haven't discovered the depth of that emotional issue. So then they go deeper into it. Other people will say, okay, well, should I be journaling? Journaling uh, is great for people, especially for people who aren't that emotionally aware and the issue is emotional. But see, one part but I, of my- Wait, 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 back up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> because I'm an emotional person. I love journaling. So I'll, everyone out there- <laughs> <laughs> that was like, wait, oh, wait, no, wait, no, 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 wait, okay. wait, wait, that's yep. me, but good just point. clarify that. <laughs> good, good point. There are people who are very emotionally aware who get a lot out of journaling also. Yeah, okay. Uh, but I find when it comes to mind-body issues, yeah, 
journaling especially is effective for people who aren't that aware of it because it gives gotcha. them a process to do it. Makes sense. Journaling yeah. can be great. The one time when journaling is not as useful is when it isn't an emotional issue. So you're mm. digging around, looking for an emotion. You're trying to find it. One thing I want to put in everybody's minds is it's not always emotional. The onset of symptoms always is. But if you had an onset of a symptom four years ago, you're not still in that emotional state. I can guarantee you, you are not in the same place you were four years ago. It's never true. We change. You might have been at a, different levels of, of a particular emotion. Yes. Like yes. If you are in anger, you might have moments of fury <laughs> and ang- and and just well, typical annoyance. Well, you can but, you, you can know. have that. You can have that, but you also could be. Let's say you got angry four years ago and it dissipated after two weeks, but the symptom didn't. Mm. The reason the symptom didn't is it's a doubt issue. So uh, often w- one of the tenets of the emotional column is that you're actually trying to rule out what's emotion and what's doubt. Okay. Power comes later. First, you're trying to rule out emotion and doubt. Which which one is the primary function here? And a lot of that depends on how long has it been there? Is it consistent? Mm-hmm. What is the timing? Uh, and, and then you work to pair the emotion with the symptom. But if you can't, uh, first of all, you can let that go. You know, it's a useful tool to be able to say, oh, yes. Like when we had Katie Haller on and we talked about um, that uh, she was talking to her father on the phone and then her knee started hurting and we paired a specific emotion she was having there with the symptom. At the time, you know, she was like, I'm worried he's mad at me. And I said, I think you might be mad at him. (laughs) And then she started thinking about that and then the symptom went away. So that that's evidence of an emotional issue. But if that doesn't happen, mm. it doesn't mean it's not an emotional issue necessarily. If it does happen, it is. You cannot cure a mind-body pain if you don't have the right diagnosis. What are we going to ask? I was just going to say, just in what you just said, you know, having that connection of um, understanding that, that emotion, the pain, the, you know, the immediacy of, watching it, you know, Mm -hmm. gives you such a sense of control and power. I can see how those things kind of lead up to, I see what you're saying about, you know, that, that power column too, not even just being something that you're trying to figure out, but it's also realizing that you have it, you know, I mean, I could imagine feeling really stuck maybe in certain um, parts of of going through this process, but then suddenly saying, because I remember in my own journey of feeling that exactly that, when I understood that that stress would show up in all different parts of me, not just in one spot consistently, I had such such a comfort and understanding that, like what you're saying is, and especially as we talked to Katie, um, I I felt such a connection to what she was saying because of that. Um, of having been through that myself and then seeing that, wow, I actually have some control and some power over how I experience this. So I can see how what you're saying, you can, you may suddenly be well. I mean, just Mm -hmm. in under, just in understanding that. I mean, obviously I'm sure it's, it's a, a long, um, process for some, but I can also understand how it can be. Um, almost miraculous force for others. Um, right. So, so, and, and that's a very key point, and I want to make a point going along with it. So awareness is often enough. You know, when, when people say, what do I do? Mm. I sometimes tell them, listen, all you need to do is be aware right. of what you are feeling and how that does lead to the symptoms. But there's a caveat to that which is it doesn't work that way for everybody and it doesn't work that way for everybody at every moment. Right, right. The reason though that I think I can be particularly helpful is that I understand the distinctions of what makes it go well for one person versus another. And it is not random. As an example, there are people, uh, I, I got the woman with the headaches on on, on the mind, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I saw her, saw her today, so she's fresh. Um <laughs> But she's somebody who grew up in a family that never really talked about feelings that much. Mm. 
Now, if you take somebody like that versus somebody who talked about feelings all the time, the one who talked about feelings all the time is more likely to have that kind of miraculous emotional uh, recovery. So that's one category of, of people that sometimes it takes longer with. And I, I want you guys to be really gentle on yourselves about what type of person you are. You didn't make your circumstances. Uh, there's other things I can say about it, but I, you, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was just having a conversation with someone today about this very thing um, that, you know, back, I don't know, a generation or two ago, or maybe, I mean, I shouldn't even say that because it's, it's I'm sure in some families still happens today, um, where, you know, your mom or your dad might say to you, it's all in your head. Like, just, it's all in your head. But at the same time, they'll, they don't believe in a mind body, you know, right. um, no. pain. So they'll be like, you're crazy. Did they, like, that's, there, there's no, you know, it's in your head, but it's not in your body. Yeah, <laughs> right? No, it's, it's the exact opposite of what everything is. I mean, it's from the head in the case of what we're talking about. But right. it's totally real in the body. But if you started to explain that this connection, it's like, no, that's, uh, there's no such thing as. No, you know, no, that, that's, that's crazy. Just, no, that's, it's crazy yeah, talk. <laughs> <laughs> but my friend was saying that's how she grew up. And she said, you know, if I had only had that understanding, um, but it certainly wasn't coming from home because it was kind of like, you know, yeah, it's in your head, but, you know, you're fine. Yep. <laughs> there's something going on. That's, well, and that so, is tough. That's really well. And wh- what you're what you're talking about is speaking to one of the hardest parts of being a pain sufferer, which is there's this whole internal web that we have of our own thought process and whether we think we're good or whether we like ourselves. And right. you know, so I say to people sometimes, and this can be encouraging. Another reason that people sometimes can't have that miraculous emotional pairing of a symptom and then it goes away. Sometimes people who are super smart. They can't, they just can't do it. They have too many questions. So then we have to go the doubt route. And, and so sometimes great advantages, great, great traits can not necessarily serve you that well. Another one is there's some people who don't like to focus on themselves. They don't want to make it a big deal. And I often need to help them say, you are allowed to be a big deal here. So we're going to talk more about this. I wanted to get to one of our, one of our frequently asked oh, sure. questions. Yeah. Um, this takes us in a a slightly different direction, but I sometimes like that kind of variety. But again, please put your comments, uh, comments in. We want to hear from you. If you've got questions, we will bring them on the show. So one question that I got is what do I do when I am afraid something will hurt, even though I know it is a mind body issue? Okay. So this is what I call a trigger. This is more in the doubt field. So I know we're talking about emotions, but this is more when you're talking about the doubt column you have an expectation that something's going to hurt. I actually found it very helpful. There's lots of ways to deal with this, but one of the things is that you want to you want to think emotionally. Uh, so you don't want to be so rooted in the physical experience. You want to think about your emotional life, but you also want to do some self-talk. When I was recovering from back pain after reading Sarno, I would lift my kids up and I would actually be like, I would think to myself, there's no reason this is going to hurt because I'm fine. And I lift them up. And I was shocked. It didn't hurt. Um, I've worked with people before with all kinds of symptoms. I've even experienced some of these myself, but I won't give you TMI. But the, uh, I guess I'm going to because now I'm going to reveal what this is. (laughs) So people sometimes complain about painful urination. Uh, So this is something that actually happened to me post uh, hernia surgery just a little bit. It wasn't too bad, but it was stinging a little bit. And I was like, Hmm. And I I didn't even ask myself, could this be a mind body thing? I was like, this is a mind body thing, but how do I deal with it? I needed to directly at the moment of going, sorry, it is TMI. um, I needed to say to myself, this is a mind body thing. I needed to keep it in my conscious mind. So this actually fits with what we are talking, what we were just talking about. What's in your conscious mind makes a big difference for what then happens. Now that doesn't mean it's always going to work, especially if you don't believe it. If you're just saying it, right? That doesn't help. So you don't need to say things you don't believe. But if we can work on getting you to believe these things through logic, through science, 
through trying working through it. your questions, through trying it. Being open uh, to it. And being open to it. Great points. These are the things that, that we work on. We're going to keep bringing you things you can do because the question that is on everybody's minds about this is how. We'll keep it coming. Thank you for watching. Please click subscribe, hit like, and ring the bell for notifications on YouTube. Sign up for our newsletter on crushingdoubt.org for information on new episodes or to sign up for my live seminars. You can find us on all social media at Crushing Doubt. And if you have questions you'd like answered, send us an email at info at crushingdoubt.org. And if you'd like to make a donation, head on over to Venmo at Crushing Doubt. I am here to help you resolve your doubts on your journey and find powerful, peaceful, and happy living.